Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Cheat Codes. I am your host, Tosh, with Women in Games International. And little known fact about me, I am a person who loves storytelling. From podcasts to movies to video games, a good story will always make me happy. It's such a gift to be able to paint a picture in the mind's eye. The, the most amazing thing about gaming to me is not only do you get to tell a story, but you get to do so in a way where the player becomes one with the story. Choose your adventure. With me today, I have Paulina, a producer, a Women in Games ambassador, speaker, and mentor extraordinaire. And today we're gonna to talk about storytelling in the gaming world. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here, Tash. I'm really appreciative that you took time out of your busy schedule to talk to us about gaming in this aspect and storytelling. And we get to tell a story today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what's been the best part of this year for you? Not this year, but the was just started. But last year, big or small, what's been the best part? I think just like a recent example that comes to mind is just like being able to spend time with my family over the holidays. Because I do, I live in the States, but I do have all of my family from my side still back in Finland. I grew up in Helsinki. So every time I get to visit them back in Helsinki, it's kind of like a special moment for me. And I try to do that twice a year at least. So we were there with my husband over the holidays and that was really a, kind of a highlight for me. I love that. I love where in the world are you now? Where do you, what state do you live in? I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. So in, in Madison. Midwest. So you just like cold weather? Is that what's happening? <laughs> That's my thing. Yeah, I was in California in Los Angeles before coming to Wisconsin. I was there for about two years. And it was wonderful having the warm weather and the ocean right there and being able to surf and just seeing palm trees whenever you step outside. But having grown up in Finland, which is generally, for those who don't know, like a pretty cold place with a pretty long winter, Wisconsin definitely feels like home to me in that sense. Yeah. There's four seasons, which we didn't have in Los Angeles. And there's really cold winters, but still warm summers and really all the whole spectrum of seasons. So I do enjoy that. And it reminds me of my home, Helsinki. I like that. I'm in California and it was, for me, it was 38 degrees the other day, 38 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you who were around the world. And I thought, this is how I go. I, I don't know <laughs> if I'm equipped to survive this. <laughs> <laughs> That's understandable. Yeah, I, don't, I know I'm not, I'm not made out of the made out of the tough. I'm not tough in that aspect. When it comes to anything mildly chilly, I that's it's over for me. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's completely understandable. Maybe, maybe, maybe one day. That's a goal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good goal. And one tip for me from a person who grew up in the middle of the coldest. It's all about the clothes. Wear a lot of layers. That will get you far. That's what I need. I need layers. I'm not <laughs> equipped. I am not. No. <laughs> So bringing the conversation back to gaming, do you remember the first game you ever played? I do, yeah. So when I was very young, and we're talking like probably like five or six years old, dad bought me and my sister this computer game. I think it was like probably a Windows 95 game given the time window. And it was the first like computer game that we got and it was mind-blowing like we were so excited we played it every day and we like couldn't wait to get out of school or daycare so we can start playing and we got better every day as we were playing it and then only like years later that we realized that it was actually this like game where you solve math equations against the timer <laughs> so, so our dad basically got us a game that was just solving math equations against the timer and lo and that's behold good. we both became pretty good at math but that's a win right there that's a parenting win <laughs> i know <laughs> it's still funny and i like i was convinced that it's still a real game but even now like when i try to google it like it doesn't exist. I don't know where he got the game from. It was called 
Mathemagicus, but try to Google it. There's nothing <laughs> that comes up. <laughs> but it was great. We loved it. We had a great time with it. But outside of this math game, I think the first game that I played, there was an actual like game that people might recognize. It was Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, which was also like an old PC game. Oh, it was the first 3D game in the yes. series back then, and it was trailblazing and it was in my mind the graphics were like straight from the movies and now like right. if i look at some screenshots definitely not but how did we really would get immersed i remember playing i think tomb raider for the first time and thinking oh my gosh this is amazing and now i look back and i'm like oh she was just a rectangle <laughs> why didn't i realize she was a rectangle i know but i but that's kind of the amazing thing about games is that it just it meets us where we are yeah that is very true and it's really like your mind fills up like so much of the empty space that's left for you that you think back to some of those old games and their graphics or even when we think about like books how much like your mind actually fills the, of the empty gaps so that it seems like oh, it's like crystal clear in, in front of me and then in reality like it's absolutely not <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I get that too. And it, the, that's how imagination is such a key aspect of, of all of this. And if you have a healthy imagination, you could go anywhere and be anywhere. I think yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So what got you interested in the gaming industry? So I always loved games, but I actually, I didn't plan to have a career in games. Like I played a lot of games since I was, again, like very young, but I somehow didn't realize that there's people actually making the games that I'm playing and that's something that you can make a career out of. So I like did my thing in school. I went to university to study business. And still while doing that, I wasn't really sure what I went to do after I graduate. But then I actually ended befriending this like group of friends who were into like startups and into mobile gaming. Cause this was around the time when Angry Birds was like becoming a big thing and like mobile gaming was like, what is this thing? And they're right. making so much money with this game. And it was the hottest thing. So I ended up hanging out with people who were very into this type of scene. And then it just so happened that the office of Rovio where they were making Angry Birds was actually next to my university or almost next to my university. So it was like all of the buzz in my school and like so somehow very tangible having it so close there and like almost like seeing how the sausage is being made across the yes. street so i i got like interested in games but i was still like i don't know like how do you get into that like it felt such i don't know like a distant option in the sense that there they are making it but how do you actually like get into it but then i got an opportunity to go to this startup boot camp again as part of these like circles that i was running around with in school and this boot camp was basically like a startup boot camp for a month in in england in university of cambridge and there every participant was honing their business ideas and figuring out like what's the next big thing and I somehow got an idea there that there's this game concept that's going to be great this is going to be the next Angry Birds right after the current Angry Birds is going to sunset their success so I came back from the from the boot camp and I was really motivated and okay games is my thing this is what I'm going to do so I started learning how to make games. I started learning programming on my own, started prototyping some very ugly stuff <laughs> on Android. And then the following year, I started my own game company, which sounds fancier than it actually was. It was still me in my garage with two of my friends. But nevertheless, like actually started making games and figuring out like, how do you get from an idea into putting something in the app store and having people actually enjoy consuming whatever it is that you've done. And that was really great. That was really the like confirmation that I really want to work in games and this is fun and there's so many opportunities, but also learned very quickly that <laughs> It's not as easy as it seemed for, for my hopeless visionary back then. What happened was I eventually ended up shelving the company as I graduated from university with the idea that 
I need to go into a bigger game company and learn like how do you make games so then I can come back one day to my own company yeah. and actually do them knowing what I'm trying to achieve and actually that's the road I'm still on today and I absolutely love it I love that so I mentioned at the top of the show that you are a producer and for some people the word producer seems like such a huge job with so many lanes so how would you describe that job to someone who's just entering the industry yeah yeah i think that's a very good and very fair question because i think even if you ask from different producers you probably get slightly different answers to this because it depends a lot on like your personal approach to production and what producer's role really is but in like my take on this topic is that producers are basically project leaders, meaning that their responsibilities consist of both running the project and then the team that's working on the project. And it doesn't mean necessarily like directly being responsible, for example, like, like leadership of the team members, but it means that you're responsible for the totality of the project that includes both the people making it and the product itself. But I actually wrote down in my notes this like an analogy that I once read for what do producers do? What is the role of a producer? And I think it's a really good one. I don't want to take credit for it. This is not like original Paulina material, but but quote for an unknown person who once said that think of video game production and development as a giant ship in which all the different disciplines such as art and design and programming work to make sure that the ship moves ahead it stays afloat and the engines keep running and the producer is the captain of the ship and they're the ones who let the crew and and the ship know where it's supposed to go, what's the schedule that we need to reach the harbor at, and whatever else is needed in order to get to the port in time. And the captain's also responsible for making sure that the ship stays on the schedule that's agreed and course corrects whenever it's needed to make sure that you reach your port in time and, and, and in the schedule as you have planned. I think that's a really accurate represent like analogy yes. and representation of what producers do. So you're just like you do everything to make yes. sure that the sort of the what we would call the holy trinity of project management is kept intact and that's basically time, quality and budget. So you have to keep an eye on the bigger picture of it all. Exactly. Yep. I get that. So if I have an idea for a video game, I don't really, but <laughs> hypothetically speaking, if I have an idea for a video game and video game is the tree, my idea is the seed, where do I start? I really think that the seed of everything is the story itself, because regardless of what type of game you're making, or whatever type of entertainment that you're making, whether it's active or passive medium, do I want to convey to someone else? And what story do I want to tell? And if we think of, if we think broader in terms of, again, like all of entertainment, not just necessarily video games, but movies, TV, books, and of course games as well, like they're, all of them have stories. And for passive mediums, such as, books or movies, it's often clearer to the consumer that you are consuming a story. It's for example, like books, it's very obvious that I'm reading a story of something, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, it's usually it's a story of something. With games, it's not always as obvious necessarily. However, there's always a story behind everything. So there are more like obvious choices that you can pick to play with like very narrative driven games, like looking at you, The Last of Us, or you can pick something that's even like a game that was made based on books, which is even more obvious that it comes from a story like The Witcher series. But that's not always the case. Not every game is like necessarily that narrative driven or that obviously like a story. So you can take, for example, sports games like FIFA or NHL, where you can take some FPS games like Counter-Strike and argue that oh, they don't have a narrative. They're just 
performative games, but they do. It's just not yeah. as obvious as as some other like more narrative driven games because it's more of you creating the story for yourself right. rather than a narrative designer having pre-written the story for you in advance. But it all comes down to stories in the end. And like it's not a coincidence that a lot of sports games, for example, right now are using these like career modes for the games because right. people love stories and they love building their own story. Like if it's I like can... a RPG element <laughs> in these games and people don't necessarily, they don't, it brings them in, but they don't realize like, you're playing a role playing game right now. Exactly. Secretly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's spot on. Because people love that they love yes. being a part of the story and that's one of the great things about like storytelling in video games like you said in the beginning that like, there is no more immersive way of being part of the story than in the form of video games I like that. The, it, it, you made that really palatable i it if i did not have any understanding even the understanding i have now on what it means to be a producer i feel like you have broadened that for me and given me more understanding so i appreciate that thank you so much oh that's great i'm glad to hear <laughs> so i i would love to know what draws you personally into a game so i like not because we're talking about stories but like I genuinely love good stories and I love problem solving. I love puzzles and a lot of this is derived by emotions. And I love playing games where I get the feeling of, oh, that's interesting, like mystery or horror or games where I feel like I'm like discovering something after trying really hard or it's like a puzzle that I've spent a lot of time solving and eventually get that like, yes, I managed <laughs> to figure it out. Like. I love that type of games and I love a good story to go with it, whether it's driven by myself or it's a pre-written narrative. So like I said, RPGs, horror, adventure, mystery. I love being immersed into like good stories and captivating ambiances. Yes. Some examples of my fav recent like favorite games that I've played are like until dawn is a great example of like very story driven like i love the ambience and i love the being able to control the story even though and some people argue that how much of a how much control do we do have, you have? <laughs> exactly <laughs> but i love that type of games like the quarry as well or really any of the super massive titles from the recent years they're great I love the Witcher series because I just love the lore of the Witcher and Skyrim. I think it's a great like example of an RPG where you really like can do whatever you want in just like a fantastic world and ambience, like dragons, swords, yes. mages, like all <laughs> that, like just attending the mage school. It's just so cool and so fun and that's like one of the things that i think are, are, is great about games as well and what like motivates me when i say great uh, like captivating ambience is hitting places i can't visit in real life it can be like a jungle from tomb raider yes. it can be the mage school in which in in skyrim so i think that's really like motivating for me seeing cool places and doing things where i i feel like i'm outdoing myself when i was younger i preferred like faster based games a little bit shooters and i love driving games but nowadays i really prefer like puzzles and riddles over speed and fireworks and in addition to like good stories i think that something that's really like driving me is i talked about emotions before it's really the chase of the emotions of succeeding in something that was difficult in the beginning and then also the feeling of yes I figured this out and suspense yes. and all that I think is what really draws me into any given game. I love that too. I like I love games with little goals where I okay I know that I need to get this to this level so that I can get this weapon and I can get this weapon then I can beat this so it's like how just going from place to place with like little mini achievements and 
I will some either I'm completely focused on beating the game or I'm completely focused on every single side quest for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Because there is reason. Side quests is where it gets juicy. That's what everyone's kind of telling you the secrets of the land. And forget <laughs> that I'm playing a major thing. It's like, I, but did you hear what she said? So I, I get sucked in that way. <laughs> oh yeah, that's great. What's your favorite game? Right now, I think my favorite game is Tiny Tina, Tiny oh, Tina's nice. Wonderland, because oh, that cool. not, it's funny and it comments on itself. So it's not taking itself seriously at all. Even the NPCs are just commenting essentially about being NPCs. And that just cracks me up because I'm like, they know I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's it was so much fun. That was the only game that I had that I didn't draw it out. Usually I'll play like a little bit, a little bit, but that one I just spent the whole weekend just because I wanted to hear more people talk and I wanted to see more and see more. And then I was done. I said, oh no, I finished it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, that's a great game. Good choice. I do love storytelling. Right now I am playing Stardew Valley. I got, my colleagues got me into that and I'm married, but I'm in a loveless marriage. So I'm trying to work that out right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, good luck with that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's a hard life. It's a hard life. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> so I, I think that it's really important to have a variety of voices in storytelling. I would love to have a quick chat with you about why that's important to have different diverse voices and just telling the stories that we see. Yeah. Yeah, that's super important. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I think that not everyone's story is the same and not every story resonates with everyone. So this is why we need stories from various characters, various sources. There's as many different types of people that we have consuming the stories that we tell. We need an equal amount of diversity in the creators of these stories so that there is something for everyone. And I think that if we think, for example, like Game of Thrones, one of the most popular TV series of all time that everyone watched and then no one rewatched ever, but <laughs> right. irrelevant. But there's it's the stories of the like numerous characters of the show that draw everyone in. Like the whole whole root of the show is like the stories of the the numerous characters that you have. Some of them you root for, some of them you can't stand. But would there be a story if everyone was like no joffrey you can have the throne it's all good no, all right <laughs> so like the whole premise of the show is that everyone comes from different backgrounds different places and all all these characters uh, interact and they're fighting for the iron throne and this is what makes the story alive come people coming from different places and perspectives so in a way like having diverse characters and the diverse perspective of those diverse characters is super important for storytelling. But then there's the different aspect, which is the fact that like diversity is not needed just to create drama or create entertainment when it comes to right. storytelling, but it's also super important for educating people. And this is even more why we can't just have a single angle when it comes to telling a story or a single perspective. Because what I mean by educate is that we can learn about things that we're not familiar with through the stories of those people. So like increasing the representation of minorities and the general improvement in diversity and entertainment has already taught like millions of people that things that like you might not see yourself in your like daily life are completely and just because you don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it's like wrong or because it's different from what you're used to something right. to like frown upon because it's usually it's not so i think that like it's been really great to see how much more for example minorities are like better represented in tv and across all of entertainment really and there's still a lot of work to be done on this front 
but I think we're really trending in a good direction and I hope this trend keeps up because it's so important that diversity allows us to create this juicy drama of Game of Thrones. It also allows us to normalize things and make sure that there is exposure across the globe to different types of ways of living and different types of people, different types of habits. Because in the end, that that understanding and the exposure is really what, and this can sound like kind of cliche, but like enriches our culture and our minds and our way of viewing the world eventually. Yes. I've under in gaming it always was so interesting to me especially as a child how something as simple as choosing my character could be so restrictive it didn't occur to the people who were in the room that if even if this person is picking a, ca a character as ident identified as female that maybe they don't want to wear these clothes or maybe they don't yeah. want to sound like this and it just didn't occur. It wasn't as if they were being like, oh, no, this is not, it's not going to be the case. It's just there there was no one in the room to say, what if they don't sound like that? Or what if they don't dress like that? And yeah. that's how the story grows to include more people just by having different voices to say, but what if, what about this? Or have we considered this? Because this is how I felt. I know you may yeah. not have ever felt like that, but I feel like this. Yeah, yeah, and that's really spot on. And it's so important. And like these questions, like if we don't have diverse people building the story, then how can we expect the outcome to be diverse and inclusive to diverse audiences? Yes, it helps everyone. <laughs> Exactly. And it's scientifically proven. Like people love asking that why is diversity important? But like it's scientifically proven that yes. like almost any outcome is better if you have a diverse group behind it rather than this is a really difficult word for a non English speaker. Homogenous. Homogenous yes. One. <laughs> that is you said it well. Yeah. <laughs> so what one piece of advice that you can share with women in the gaming industry to who have interest in the gaming industry today? I think that right now, it's a very interesting time in the video game industry. There's really never been a better time to join the industry and really be unapologetically your like genuine self because there, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of discussion about DE&I surrounding the game industry in the recent years and good and more often than not and bad, unfortunately. But all of this conversation has resulted in and been accompanied by some of the biggest changes also that we've seen in the game industry in the recent years when it comes to driving DE&I agenda across companies. Things are definitely not perfect right now, far from it. I think that the, there is a really good momentum right now for a positive change. And there is a great opportunity right now to really join the industry and be you, be yourself. Don't shy away from wearing the clothes you want to wear or making your voices heard in meetings as a woman, like in a male dominated industry, because this conversation is happening right now. It's every opportunity to take advantage of the momentum that's ongoing. And it's actually very important that people do because only through change can we actually make sure that like history doesn't repeat itself and we don't just fall right. back into the old patterns that we've seen in our industry when it comes to diversity and inclusion, but rather move forward as a more diverse industry with better representation of minorities and better representation of the actual demographics of people who play the games, which is everyone. Right. Yes. Those voices matter. And, and it's, there's room for every, for us to be in the room and not only to be in the room, but like you said, to be ourselves in those spaces. And exactly. that's, it does take bravery, I believe. It's yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's still a male dominated industry and it's for sure not every company is as progressed as the next one. But like I said earlier, I think it's important that these conversations are happening and that there is this momentum right now that 
a lot of people want to do and a lot of companies want to do better better they're still figuring out how to do that exactly i feel like there's a lot of like trial and error but it's better than nothing and as long as we're working like as women in a male dominated industry as we're as long as we're working toward making sure that our voices are heard and that whoever wants to join this industry as a minority representative that they feel safe and welcome and we can hopefully also educate our allies and educate those people who want to be allies but don't necessarily know how yet to get there one day and then have a more safe and welcoming industry overall for anyone who wants to join it. Thank you. Is there anything else you would like to add or talk about something coming up next for you or social media? Anything else? I will be in GDC in March. So if there's anyone who's going to be in GDC, I would love to say hi and high five. So if you're in there, Tash, if anyone else is there and you see me, if you have my contact, don't hesitate to reach out. Would love to meet up. And then if in terms of social media, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. I talk a lot about game development and like working in the game industry as a woman. I recommend following me there if that's a topic and that's the type of content that anyone's interested in. Um, And otherwise, you can find me on Discord for chat anytime, Twitter, on both both platforms, and Hermonini. But as a caveat for those two platforms, while my LinkedIn content is more curated when it comes to giving tips for working in the game industry and whatnot. My Twitter and my Discord are way more uh, unsolicited game reviews <laughs> and hot takes on whatever is on my mind that day. Same. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anywhere, any platform, I am always approachable and happy to talk to anyone who wants to think up and talk about games or anything else. I should have asked this in the beginning, and please forgive me for asking now, but how do I say your last name? <laughs> Turnquist. Turnquist. Very good. Very good. It's a tough one. It's a Swedish name. (laughs) I I said it once and I'm afraid to say it again. I really want to. Tried it to my head and not my heart. (laughs) (laughs) No, you did a great job. (laughs) So thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I think that you did an excellent job of, of making this something tangible and I'm hope, I hope that anyone that's listening today can really take a step back and say where do I want to start and what stories do I want to tell and find like-minded people and make your stories happen because it's fully possible I love that <laughs> thank you so much for having me Tash thank you and thank you for tuning in to Cheat Codes thank you to my guest Paulina I'm your host Tosh to stay in the know with Women in Games International please visit us at getwiggy.com and subscribe to our newsletter and you can also find us on multiple social media platforms at getwiggy take care and we will chat soon <laughs>